Why did it happen? Why did I fall down? What does it mean to animate realistic movement? If you want to know why and apply this knowledge into your animation, stick around. There are so many components that make an animated shot great, but what it essentially boils down to can roughly be grouped into two categories – performance and movement. And while performance is king, it couldn't be believable and it couldn't achieve its goal to connect with the audience if it's not backed by solid mechanics of movement. And it doesn't really matter whether what you are showing on screen is supposed to be reality or not. It can be realistic, it can be cartoony. As Richard Williams said in Animator Survival Kit, in order to depart from reality, our work should be based on reality. We're going to talk about physics, guys. And I know that some of you might not be super happy about it, and that's understandable, because we usually choose art when we want to get away from math and physics and science, but there are animators who love physics and who understand the importance of physics and animation and want to learn more about it. Not just because of curiosity, but simply to be better at this. We are all different and this is great because this is what makes our work unique. Here is what we are going to cover in this video. How do I make my animation look believable? What you need to know as an animator? We will cover gravity and balance, inertia, forces and momentum, and how they can be useful for you. No matter whether your medium of choice is 2D or 3D or live action or video games, it doesn't matter. And we will talk about one particular force that is a lot of times overlooked by animators, but is actually pretty important if you want to be able to animate realistic movement. The answer is by understanding. If we can understand why things are happening, why they move the way they are, it becomes much easier for us to animate them. And while animation is commonly referred to as an art form, I like to think about it as a much broader discipline, one that fuses together science, art and acting. And I know acting is also type of art, but it's performing arts. And I would say that the art part of this equation is very important, but it doesn't dwarf the subject of the nature of movement. If you want to be a good animator, you just can't ignore this part. The connection between animation and physics is very deep. And in order to prove this, let's take a look at the holy grail of animation, the animation principles. Squash and stretch is based on the law of conservation of mass. Anticipation is used to build the momentum, follow through and overlapping action. This one is based on momentum and Newton's inertia laws. Slow in and slow out. This is acceleration and deceleration and they are based on Newton's second law. Watch my video on timing and spacing for more info on this. Arcs are based on physical properties of objects, secondary action. Not always, but almost always we add secondary action to give more life to the world in which the characters live, essentially adding physical movement. Timing and spacing, of course. Exaggeration, this is actually opposing the laws of physics, but you need to know the laws first when you need to break them. Solid drawing, which is called solid posing in 3D, and it's very well connected with physics, and later in this video I will show you why. Physics is everywhere. And our lives are governed by the laws of physics, whether we want to admit it or not. And when we watch animation as an audience, we definitely compare our experience that is stored in our brains with the information that is shown to us on screen. And we can suspend disbelief to a certain degree, depending on the genre and style of animation, but it has to be done on purpose and it has to be consistent. But generally, our eyes are very sharp when it comes to realism. I think I have been convincing enough for you that this subject is worth looking into if you want to be able to animate realistic movement, right? Let's do it. What do you need to know as an animator? What will help you in your work? Let's start with the easiest but the most important stuff – gravity and balance. Animation is a collection of poses shown to you by one frame at a time. So, good posing is essential for animation. And it doesn't really matter whether it's a 2D hand-drawn pose or posing a 3D rig in 3D space. One of the fundamental concepts of a pose, along with a line of action, is balance. 
I actually decided to go film some examples for you, and what is a better place to do this than a museum of science in downtown Boston. So I'm heading there right now, and we'll see if I can film everything without scaring the visitors inside. In order to be able to achieve balance in a pose, we need to know what is the center of gravity and where we can find it. First misconception about the center of gravity is that it's some kind of a center point in the middle of your body, right around the navel area, and it is where it stays for us humans all the time. The second misconception is that the center of gravity is around the hips. In this area and what confuses us even more is that most of the time the main control located usually around the hips this one is called COG in the rigs and when we manipulate this control you can see this center here and we think that this center is the center of gravity this is wrong well, depending on the character, it can be so that when the rigger is rigging the character in the default pose, the center of gravity and the center of the control of the hips could be located at the exact same position. But that's about it. In reality, the control is being called this way because it's closer to the center of gravity for a character in a default pose and, as a result, if you move that control, you will affect the center of gravity in a big way. And for Stuart, in this pose, in the default pose, the center of gravity will be right around here, because how big his head is. And here comes what I wanted to say. There is no such physical point that is inside your body that is the center of gravity. Instead, center of gravity is an imaginary point that indicates the average position of your object's weight distribution. In simple and uniform objects like this, it can be located at its geometric center, but most of the time it's not. And because as living creatures we can change our shape, our center of gravity is constantly shifting. If I move my arm to the side, I already shifted my center of gravity. If I'm staying on one leg, I'm shifting it even more. And here is where balance comes into play. When I'm standing like this, or like this, like this, or even like this, the area that touches the ground and prevents me from falling is called base of support. If I want to be balanced, I need the line of gravity, which is another imaginary term, just a line that runs through center of gravity straight down, to be inside that base of support. The moment when it goes outside, I am unbalanced and falling. This happens because of the simple principle. If nothing prevents a stationary object from lowering its center of gravity, then it will do so. Think of it as the following. If nothing prevents you from doing work standing up, then you will sit down or lie down in bed. Same thing happens with center of gravity. When I pick up an object, be that light or heavy object or another character, the center of gravity is of course shifting as well. That's why I need to compensate and lean in the opposite direction from where the center of gravity shifted. And the heavier the object is, the more I need to compensate. So by showing the amount of compensation, you are describing the weight to the audience. So when our center of gravity is shifting away from the base of support, it's becoming more and more difficult to maintain balance. So we naturally tend to change our posture to ease this effect and regain balance. Obviously, the smaller the area that's touching the earth, the smaller the base of support is, the easier it is to throw us out of balance. Or in this example, we need to move our arm and leg into the position as far out as we can so that we can balance the line of gravity to be inside the base of support. We can dramatically shift the balance even if we are not carrying weight, just by changing our pose, changing our body shape. The classic example of this is bending forward. Center of gravity in this case is even outside of our body. If we don't compensate and move back, then we'll fall. Try this at home, stand near the wall and try to bend forward, you will fall immediately. We talked a little bit about Newton's second law, the law of acceleration, in one of my previous videos on timing and spacing. By the way, if you haven't seen it, I'm going to link it in the corner here. So in order to understand how things move, 
we, we need to know what forces are present in our universe, at least on our planet Earth, because we are not really concerned about planet-sized objects here, just simple stuff. By the way, if you are feeling like you are getting value out of this, please give me a thumbs up down below. Going back to Newton, the wonderful law of inertia is the law that we experience every day without paying much attention to it. We're either fighting it or taking advantage of it, and we're doing this subconsciously. You know, when we walk, we don't really think about how to place one foot in front of the other, how to swing our arms or how to shift the weight. But as animators, we need to understand what are the reasons behind the motion in order to successfully imitate real life. And that's where the division line starts that separates us from live-action actors. So, first law of Newton, the law of inertia, says An object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion, with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Which in a nutshell means that objects keep doing what they were doing, and by doing that they remain in balance, until an unbalanced force comes into play. Classic example of this is taking a ride on a subway train or any public transportation basically. What happens is people who are not holding on, onto something and, and standing inside with each brake and acceleration, they just swing back and forth. And sometimes they even fall. The reason why this is happening is because of the law of inertia. Our base of support is shifting under us and our body, our center of gravity, and the line of gravity are now not under the base of support and we fall. And the main reason why this is happening is because we don't know when the driver is supposed to brake and accelerate. And because we don't know, we can't prepare ourselves and shift our center of gravity before that. But the key thing to remember here is the way we perceive how the character reacts depends on the observation point. In the world of animation, it basically means where the camera is. If it's on the train, when the train starts moving and the character falls, the body will appear to be falling backwards. While if the camera is on the train station, it will appear that the character is not actually translating backward, but instead it's staying in one place until it's on the floor and the train takes it away. And similarly, when train is stopping, the distance that the character will travel falling forward is much bigger if observed from the outside as opposed to from the inside, because the train is not stopping instantaneously, it slows into the stop. So you are adding the distance here. And also another important thing is when the train stops, the speed of the character falling can't exceed or be substantially lower than the speed of the train that the character was traveling on. Because the character gained a momentum, the, the speed should be consistent. And you check this by spacing. And of course, think about how massive the character is, because momentum is product of mass and velocity. So if you, for example, have two characters that are on the same train and the train stops, the character that weighs more will travel greater distance. So keeping all this in mind, we can really understand the principles of drag, follow through, and what the nine old man called the overlapping action. Because inertia is what stays behind all this stuff. So next time you are animating a character with fleshy parts, or you are animating parts on joints, or hair, or clothing, think about inertia and you will be able to master these principles with ease. It's very common for us animators to not think about this force. We spend so much time working on individual poses when the character is basically stopped and we already have so much stuff to think about like timing and spacing, the pose itself, the balance, breakdowns, things like that. And as a result, this very important force is either completely overlooked or underestimated, especially in students' work. Centrifugal force is actually a fictitious force that is nothing more than the result of inertia. It occurs when the character or an object is taking a turn, be that a simple turn or traveling in a circle. So what this force does is just the effect of inertia that wants to keep the character going in the same direction that it was traveling before. So to overcome this force, the character is leaning into the opposite direction. And the smaller the radius of the turn, the greater is the centrifugal force. 
and the more you need to lean in. You can observe this very well with motorcycles. The drivers have to lean constantly on every turn because their base of support is so narrow that they are prone to falling over. And for cars, especially those with a passive suspension, this is very obvious. Because they can't control their tilt, they can even roll over if the turn is too tight or the speed is too high. This is by the way why the high speed roads or race tracks are built with an angle. Now if we have two characters running and turning the corner for example, the character that is closer to the corner will experience the greater centrifugal force than the character that is doing a bigger radius turn, if they travel at the same speed. However, don't confuse this example with both characters standing on a rotating platform like a disc or a cylinder. Because in this example, they are not traveling with the same speed. The farther away the character is from the center, the more distance it has to cover and thus its speed is greater. And the centrifugal force is greater as well. And you may ask here, why do ice skaters tend to hold their arms close to the body to spin faster? That's because the ice skater is actually the platform. If you model her as a cylinder, the bigger the cylinder is, the more rotational inertia it has and the centrifugal force is actually slowing her down. So to maintain high speed, she reduces the radius and thus can spin faster. I'm actually going to illustrate this one here. So here I'm spinning and then slowing down and then spinning again and then slowing down again. So the closer I get to the center point of the platform, the faster I'm spinning. So definitely don't forget about the centrifugal force. When the characters are traveling on a curve or make, a, for example, going around the corner or spinning or just, you know, turning around, uh, parts of their body are experiencing centrifugal force and you need to take this into account when you are animating them. So this all leads us to a very important subject that is called dynamic balance. And if you want to be able to animate realistic movement, you need to understand what this is. And I'm going to stop now because I don't want this video to be overwhelming and things that we need to discuss deserve their time and attention. Thank you so much for watching. Give me a thumbs up down below. Don't forget to subscribe and I will see you soon. Good luck with your animation.